Good morning. I'm David Crossway from, from BCIS. In the presentation that follows, we're going to examine the outlook for construction using both historical data and some predictions. We use a combination of the latest available official statistics and BCIS data to inform our view. So have a quick look at an agenda for today. Is a period of stagflation characterised by high inflation and low economic growth inevitable for the UK? So that's the title of the webinar and one of the um, questions that we're trying to address. So to do that, we'll provide a brief overview of the wider, wider economy. We'll examine the key fundamentals of the construction sector. We'll then summarise the outlook for construction over the next five years. And then we'll take any questions that you may have um, over the period of the webinar. Now, to answer the questions um, that you may have through the webinar, please use the chat box. Um, I'll get through as many of them as time permits at the end. Um, and for those questions that we do not get around to airing during this uh, session, we will be continuing the discussion using the BCIS LinkedIn group. This session will be recorded and made available on BCIS. So in case you encounter any technology problems, don't worry, you'll still get a chance to watch and ask questions after the event. When leaving the session today, you'll also be prompted to give feedback on, on, on the event. Um, the feedback will help us make sure we're delivering what you want in the future. Um, and also, please let us know in the survey if you have any topics that you would like us to focus on for future events. Before we get into the bulk of the presentation, it's probably worth just taking a bit of time to set the scene. Um, a question I've, I've been asking myself over the last uh, year or so is, have we gone back in time to the 1970s? Then as now the UK experienced widespread industrial action, spiralling energy costs and rampant inflation. Add in a war in mainland Europe and stagflation in the UK is becoming a real possibility. Inflation is still rising and tends to be sticky. It is remaining stubbornly high, over 10%, five times higher than the Bank of England's 2% target. And while we may have avoided a technical recession so far, quarterly GDP growth is hovering around zero, and coupled with high inflation, where there are ideal conditions for a stagnating economy. We're going to look at the outlook for construction, but first we need to examine the context of the wider economy. Let's take a look at GDP first. GDP seems to be flatlining with little or no growth and is still below pre-crisis levels. The latest forecast by the OBR suggests only one year of negative GDP growth in 2023, followed by above trend growth in the next two years. However, looking at the wider economic context, we're not convinced that the fundamentals support this upbeat prediction. If we now turn our attention to inflation, the latest data indicates that inflation is on the rise again, despite recent interest rate rises. Inflation is currently running at its highest rate since the 1970s, and rates are expected to remain relatively high for some time. The Bank of England expects CPI to fall, sh fall sharply from mid-2023, almost halving from today's levels to 5% and then returning to long-term trend by 2024. However, price rises tend to be sticky and the target for halving CPI by the end of this year looks very optimistic based on this data. Continuing interest rate rises are a blunt instrument. They have the capacity to choke the economy. Inflation has largely been driven by too little supply and not too much demand. And any impact on future demand levels from relatively high interest rates impacting the cost of borrowing could reduce investment levels further and result in increased recessionary pressures and a stagnating economy. So in the wider economy, we have the prospects of relatively high inflation and the cost of borrowing increasing combined with little or no growth. How is this scenario likely to impact construction? If we look at construction output, the chart shows new work, repair and maintenance, and total output over the last 25 years. Since our last webinar, I can report that total output has finally exceeded pre-crisis levels. And this has largely been driven by growth in the repair and maintenance sector. New work remains below 2017 levels. 
Newer Kappa is also much more volatile than repair and maintenance, being directly linked to levels of investment. And given the current economic headwinds, we expect new work output to decline going forward. If we look at short term predictions following the spring budget, um, we have our predictions for the next 12 to 18 months for sector output. And our expectations are, are essentially that only one sector will continue to grow which is infrastructure repair and maintenance, and that's likely to benefit from increased spending due to a lack of new work investment. All other sectors we expect to either stagnate <coughs> or decline. If we now look at longer term growth prospects, um, it's worth noting that new work is, is, is by far the largest sector. It's double the size of the repair and maintenance sector. Um, and in this slide, we take a, a, a look at the output, output in individual new work sectors to see which has experienced the largest changes. To the left of the red dashed line are actuals and to the right are our forecasts for output over the next five years. It's evident from the chart that some growth is predicted over the forecast period, but most sectors are either stagnant or below their previous peaks, with significant falls in output expected from the housing sectors in particular private housing. Infrastructure, which is the purple line, is the only sector forecast to remain above pre-crisis levels and exhibit consistent growth. Private commercial, which is the green line, and private housing, the orange line, show some signs of recovery towards the end of the forecast period, but remain below their previous peaks. In fact, private commercial has not fully recovered since the 2008 peak, it's suffering the fallout from the financial crash and recent changes to demand for both retail and office space, uh, space which has fundamentally changed following the, uh, the recent pandemic. Growth in all the other sectors remains relatively subdued. In this next slide, we examine the impacts on input costs. And it's clear from, from the chart um, material cost increases have been dramatic, as the orange, the orange line, um, the highest in fact since the mid 1970s. But our predictions are that, that that's going to slow the growth. The growth in materials uh, costs will be will be slowing um, as product supply continues to improve. The availability of building materials and products overall is now back to pre-crisis levels. So while inflationary pressures are expected to persist um, this year. The improved availability of most materials should help offset the worst extremes of price volatility experienced during 2022. Um, there's a slight caveat there um, that most products that are energy intensive in their production are still likely to, teach, to see some price volatility. However, materials generally sta uh, cost generally stabilising. Um, labour costs will likely replace materials as the main cost driver in the near term, uh, given the ingrained shortages, which together with high inflation is expected to push up wages over the next two years. When compared to pre-pandemic levels, the overall construction workforce has shrunk by almost 150,000, driven by a significant decline in the number of self-employed workers. In the next slide, we examine the impacts on, on building costs and tender prices. Again, to the left of the vertical line are actuals and to the right are our forecasts over the next five years. The forecast suggests that some stability is returning to costs and prices. Building costs are predicted to lead tender prices in the near term as demand softens before prices marginally lead costs by the end of the forecast period in 2028. Growth in building costs is predicted to slow significantly by the end of the forecast period. And in terms of tender prices, in 2023 and 2024, falling demand will likely result in fewer opportunities and greater keenness to tender. And the supply chain will manage or absorb some of the pressure from site wages so that the tender price index will increase more slowly than the cost index. The position reverses towards the end of the forecast period with prices leading costs as demand conditions improve. To overcome some of the problems with the data lag when using statistics, we've established a panel of expert industry practitioners 
they supplement our understanding of sector performance with anecdotal evidence. And it's useful now if we just go through a few slides to pick out some of the key measures that they've been reporting on. One of the main highlights suggests that material cost, while material costs may have stabilised, the level of uncertainty in the market hasn't really changed. So I've pulled out a few of what I think are the, are the key, key topics from, from our latest panel. Um, and price increases are, in materials are definitely slowing. So material costs are starting to settle, but they're not reducing. So there's still growth, um, but uh, they're, they're, they're not growing as, 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 as rampantly as they were last year. Um, Labour is the next big problem. So steel price falls have levelled off, steel mills are looking to increase prices due to significant energy price uplift. However, demand is quite low across all market sectors and price rises are not sticking. Pressure has abated somewhat on commodity based goods, but has increased on energy intensive goods and products. And if we look at a couple of items that have seen significant increases, plasterboard, um, insulation and bricks, all, all gone up significantly. Um, and heating and power costs are still an issue, uh, which means products such as specialist cladding and metal products are proving to be expensive. So the panel reported that staff and labour availability issues are going to grow over the near term. Labour availability is becoming an increasing issue. Um, but their conversations with contractors suggest that grassroots support for future skills is there. Um, but that doesn't avoid the current shortage of labour that is being experienced on site. And while the government's um, initiative to add five uh, occupations, construction occupations to the uh, shortage list uh, to make it easier to get visas, um, that probably won't address the, the short term immediate skills shortfall. Um, and so I suspect that the labour issue will, will or maintain. So other, other challenges reported by panel members um, around logistics. Um, reported that logistic challenges, challenges have softened, um, but there's still some long leading times uh, impacting on, on, on programme. Uh, there's particularly extended leading periods for European source materials and components, uh, no doubt um, a result of, of Brexit complications. Um, others reported logistics are not so much of a problem anymore. So most projects uh, are proposing products that could be substituted for an equal or approved uh, product if it's difficult to source. Um, leading times for materials are now, now back to, to pre-COVID levels. Um, in terms of procurement routes, uh, finding fixed prices on large project, projects was reported to be a problem because the level of uncertainty hasn't really changed um, and contractors are including a premium uh, in, in, their, in their prices for, for price volatility, particularly on, on fixed price contracts. And finally, the, the panel reported on, um, on inflation risk sharing um, and ways, ways to, to, uh, to, to tackle that, so two-stage two, uh, two pricing. Uh, cost indexation on specific trade packages. There was some reported use of PAFI, price adjustment formula indices, um, and even the consumer price inflation indices um, as, a, as, a, as a measure uh, to um, report on inflation on contracts, as well as uh, some own in-house indexation measures. Um, the use of increased use of provisional rates for items that uh, may exceed prices quoted, um, prime cost of price sensitive materials, particularly plasterboard, which has seen some rapid rises over the last year. Um, also, they're reporting there's a lot of early ordering and storing of materials off site in an attempt to offset and to use fluctuation clauses um, and fluctuation clauses based on indices and they're for certain materials, material supply only, so they don't, co they don't cover everything. Um, and again, open book uh, adjustment of, of provisional allowances. So we've got a mixed picture, I think, um, in terms of 
what's happening in construction. Um, this slide looks at um, the market conditions um, and it's asking the question, what, what, what does the future look like in terms of construction demand? Uh, we're reporting here the BCIS market factor, which is the relationship between costs and prices as a predictor of future demand conditions. So our market conditions factor has been trending downwards since the mid since mid 2020, uh, as the impacts of the crisis started to be felt. Um, just a quick note that when the MCF is rising, prices are rising faster than costs, and when it's falling, costs are rising faster than prices. So I guess our takeaway from this is that compared to the recent past, market conditions are predicted to be relatively benign out to 2028 as the impact of the downturn begins to influence the sector. There's a slight uptick in the MCF forecast through to mid-2023, followed then by a fall with costs expected to rise faster than prices before then stabilising in 2024 and being relatively flat out to 2028. So in summary, what does what, what is, what is, what is that data uh, and the commentary represent it? Um, I guess our predictions for the future, given what we now know, are that while the wider economy seems unlikely to fall into a deep recession, a sustained period of stagnation is perhaps the best that can be expected. Stagflation seems very likely with little or no growth coupled with persistently high inflation. Obviously a very challenging environment for construction investment. Indeed, I mean, new work output is still below the pre-crisis levels recorded in 2017. Um, and with levels of investment likely to remain constrained in the immediate future, as the cost of borrowing continues to increase, we don't see any increases happening in new work sector overall for some time. Indeed, forecasts suggest that new work output won't return to pre-crisis levels recorded in 2017 until the end of 2027. That's 10 years of no real growth in the sector, um, equivalent to a lost decade. On the ground, uh, material supply constraints are easing, um, so there is some good news leading to, to stabilising costs. However, we're reporting that labour will replace materials as the main cost driver going forward. Um, output in the largest subsector housing is expected to decline sharply this year. Infrastructure is really the only sector showing any sustained growth over the next five years, despite recent tinkering with HS2 and the lower Thames crossing projects. And our working assumption is that the infrastructure and construction pipeline isn't, dramatic, isn't drastically cut back. Um, in, in the autumn when the government's promised a review. So based on all we've, we've just covered, um, I think it's fair to say the outlook for construction certainly looks challenging in the immediate future. So that completes our outlook for construction, which seems slightly pessimistic. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to find some positives. Um, but I guess the stabilisation of materials cost increases might be one. Um, although most of the expected impacts reported today are on the downside, with stagflation in the wider economy and, and construction predicted for the immediate future. I'll now move on to address some of the questions that have come in during the presentation. Um, and there are some interesting ones. The, the first question is, um, what are the origins of the term stagflation? Um, and it's, it's actually not that old a term, to be honest. Um, a conservative politician, Ian McLeod, um, at the time was the spokesperson on economic issues for the Tory party uh, while it was in opposition, coined the term while speaking in the House of Commons in 1965. And he famously said, we now have the worst of both worlds not just inflation on the one side or stagnation on the other, but both of them together. We have a sort of stagflation. And that term has been adopted by economists for periods such as the one we are currently experiencing. Um, the next question is again about stagflation. 
How long could stagflation last? Um, really good question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm qualified enough to give um, a correct answer, but um, if we go back in time and look at history, um, which most economists do, um, the last period of stagflation in the UK uh, lasted over a decade. Um, it was through the 1970s and early 1980s. Um, stagflation really is a, main, a major problem for, for developed economies, uh, particularly economies that are based on consumption like ours. Um, unless managed carefully, can persist for, for a long time um, or until there's some demand growth or favourable conditions to offset the impacts of, of high inflation. Um, unchecked, it can become a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that is difficult to break out of. Um, and I think in the last webinar, we touched on the experience of, of Japan during their um, lost decade of the 1990s. And that's another quite good example of, of, of what can happen. Um, so yeah, difficult question to answer, um, but uh, based on past experience, it could be uh, a significant time period. Um, moving on, I'm sort of reading these while I'm going. Um, this is a this is a great question, um, and one that I'm struggling to to. Um, to understand myself actually, um, why are interest rate rises failing to bring down inflation? Um, and I, I think this is largely because interest rate policy is, is essentially a method of trying to control demand levels by making the cost of borrowing more expensive. Um, but inflation um, is currently being driven by supply side shortages and, and not excess demand and, and therefore to me, it seems unlikely that interest rate increases alone are going to have the desired effect. Um, I think what really needs to happen is on the supply side. So the supply supply position must be improved if we're going to if we're going to tame inflation. Um, and inflation globally, but also particularly in the UK. Is primarily being driven by increases in both food prices and energy costs and until action is taken to improve the supply position in these commodities then essentially inflation is likely to pers persist I think irrespective of interest rate policy. Um, next question a bit more construction focused rather than wider economy focused. Um, as we saw in the slides earlier, the um, housing sector output um, is forecast to fall quite dramatically through this year. Um, and the question is, what is happening to, to housing sector output? Um, this is a relatively easy one to answer, I think. Uh, I mean, property developers who are um, the housing providers uh, are speculators um, and having unsold inventory is not is not good for their bottom line. So I think in the recent past with, with rising house prices, um, developers were able to offset any increases in, in, in building costs. Um, however, um, now we're in a position with house prices stabilising or falling in some cases, interest rates rising, um, and mortgage offers declining, uh, there really is no incentive for, for property developers to continue building at the volumes that they have in the recent past. Um, the large property developers are able to control their supply to match, to match the demand um, and obviously at the same time control the prices they sell at. And it already looks as though there is a bit of an oversupply of properties, certainly new properties in the market that are, that are finished and not yet sold. So it would make sense for the developers to rein in their activity so that they can maintain uh, their margins and, and, and obviously shareholder return. So, yeah, I think, I think this, this year we're, we're forecasting a fairly significant fall off in, in private ha housing sector output. Um, with some recovery towards the end of our forecast period. But uh, yeah, the 
private developers control the market. Um, next question is something we touched on from some of the responses from the panel. Um, how can the inflation impact be best mitigated on a, on a contract? Um, the, we recommend the use of price adjustment formulae indices or, or PAFI. Um, they can certainly help. Um, and over the last year or so, um, during, during the um, inflation spike, we've seen subscriptions to PAFI increase considerably. Um, the, the price adjustment formula is, is essentially a method of calculating the increase or, or, or decrease um, in contractors' costs over a period um, using the price adjustment formula indices, um, which are published by BCIS. Um, and we'd be happy to take uh, any inquiries from you if, you if you'd like further information on, on PAFI or how best to mitigate um, inflation on construction contracts. Don't want this to be a selling exercise, uh, so moving on swiftly. Um, next question is, is there a risk that inflation will create a situation where projects get pulled or delayed, um, which could further impact growth? Um, yes, and again, I think we touched on this during, during, the, uh, during the presentation. We're already witnessing this, I think, on, on, on larger programmes of work. Um, on, on March the 10th, uh, the government announced that uh, HS2 would not reach Euston, um, uh, not until 2035, I think, at, at the, probably at the earliest. Um, and possibly even 2040. Um, so Old Oak Common will be the, the terminus for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, and at the same time as that announcement was made, um, a delay was announced to a lower, the Lower Thames Crossing uh, project, which is about nine billion pounds worth of, of road and tunnel under the Thames. Um, so both projects, changes to the scope of, of what can be delivered um, and changing, um, changed or delayed um, to, to try and compensate for the cost and price increases. Um, I think the dangers of, of, of that approach, uh, and I think the, the National Audit Office reported on this um, within the last week or so, um, are that it inevitably leads to projects costing more in the long run. Um, so it's a bit of a knee-jerk, short-term reaction uh, to try and uh, keep the can a bit further down the road, I think. Um, but but uh, yeah, we're already seeing impacts, I think, from, from, from rescheduling of, of projects. So there's definitely a risk. <clears throat> um, another good question. Will the industry have the capacity to respond if demanding conditions improve? Um, and possibly not, um, output is not only affected by um, the ability of the, uh, by demand levels, but, <coughs> excuse me, but also by the ability of the industry to, de to deliver. Um, we, we sort of covered the decline in the numbers of workers in the construction industry um, in, in the slide deck, a drop of almost 150,000 since the crisis began. Um, and the same is true of the number of firms. Uh, the statistics on business insolvencies, creations and closures in, constru in construction suggest that the industry has been shrinking um, pre since uh, pre-crisis levels. So that could obviously hinder the industry if growth returns uh, later in the decade. Um, specifically, I mean, business insolvencies in, in, in the construction industry saw a 61% increase in 2022 when compared to 2021. Um, and the majority of those insolvencies were in firms in the specialised construction material sector, um, that's about 58% of the total, followed by the construction of buildings, about a third of the total, and the rem small remaining portion in civil engineering businesses. So there's definitely um, an issue, I think, with future capacity levels 
um, particularly if demand conditions improve, um, as we're predicting later in our in our forecast towards 2028. Um, <clears throat> and we mentioned construction labour shortages um, during the during the presentation. Um, and that, another question here is where where have all the construction workers gone? Um, and I think the answer to that is probably that the industry currently has, a, has an ageing demographic. Um, the average age of, of, of workers is quite high, um, so there have been some retirements over the, over the last few years, which probably haven't been backfilled. Um, certainly Brexit and Covid also contributed to the overall loss of the construction work, workforce. Uh, some EU workers returned to their home countries during the pandemic, while others have been unable to uh, fulfil employment requirements post-Brexit, um, and indeed have, uh, have chosen to work in other countries. So the recent research by the Centre for U European Reform estimates that the end of, of, of free movement of labour in the UK has led to a shortfall of around 330,000 workers. Um, of which the shortfall in construction is estimated to be around 46,000 workers. So a considerable hole, hole to fill. And as, as we saw um, in, in the, uh, the comments from the BCIS industry panel, um, there's, there's appetite for training and, and reskilling, uh, but obviously they, these initiatives take time um, and it, it won't um, address the current short term <coughs> labour problems. Um, <clears throat> how much inflation has that actually been in construction? Well, that's, uh, that really is a good question. Um, recent estimates uh, suggest that uh, inflation added about 23 billion um, to, to annual construction output costs in, in 2022. Um, that's when compared to pre-crisis levels. Um, and that's, that's equivalent to almost half of total output in the sector. So it's a significant problem um, that we really need to get on top of. Um, another question going back a bit more to the wider economy. Um, how, do we, how do we get out of stagflation? Um, and my response is increased invest, investment levels. Um, and I don't think we need to look too far away to see um, see a particular move in the US. Um, and perhaps the government here need to adopt a similar strategy. Um, the government in the US has started a really ambitious infrastructure spending plan um, in an attempt to keep their economy growing. Um, the initiatives they've announced are expected to provide over one and a half trillion dollars um, in subsidies, incentives and tax breaks over the next decade. So a real <coughs> long-term plan. Um, it seems that uh, recognising the potential of the multiplier effect, the US have passed um, three significant pieces of legislation, um, including the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, to sort of put the US in, in the position of um, being a world leader in clean energy, reviving their domestic infrastructure um, and also working um, to move the supply of semiconductors, um, particularly um, away from China and uh, taking them in domestically. Um, and I think investment is probably, increased investment is probably the way, the way out of this problem. Um, and I guess the question is, um, could, could, we, could we do something similar here? Um, those are probably all the questions we, we've got time for today. Um, so I just want to close. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, that concludes today's webinar. Hopefully, um, next time we meet, <laughs> we'll, we'll have more positive news to report. But uh, good, good, goodbye for now and see you next time.